you've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it. But you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. All right, guys, it is my honor to introduce my guest for today's show, founder of Landcart Commercial, Sarah Landcart. Sarah, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining us here. Very much looking forward to the show. Looking forward to learning more about you, your background, uh, the founding of Landcart Commercial. You, you, you've had a lot going on in the commercial real estate world, um, have made uh, uh, many, many different career highlights along the way. Um, and I'm very excited to, to talk about each of those and uh, just the different successes that you've had throughout the years. Um, however, I like to set the foundation. And so I always find it best to um, you know, to kind of learn the personal side of, of the folk, you know, of the individual that we have on the show here as a guest. And um, so, Sarah, for those that aren't familiar with you and that don't know your background a little bit and how you got into real estate, maybe you could take a few minutes to tell us a little more about yourself. Sure, absolutely. Well, thank you again for having me today and on the show. Um, so I got started in commercial real estate about ten years ago officially, um, but had been around it kind of a ancillary through my father um, since I was a little girl, but went to college um, at Auburn University. And um, through that time at Auburn, I um, says dorky as it sounds, but was the president of the real estate club there, which was a great opportunity for me um, to have a reason to call people to meet with them, uh, to pick their brain about the real estate business and, and what they did, you know, from bankers, to appraisers, to developers, brokers, etc. Um, and so through that experience, I met with a ton of people and um, really kind of figured out that I wanted to get into the real estate business. Um, and so directly out of college, I um, started in the brokerage side of the business uh, at NAI. We were an NAI affiliate here in Fort Worth, Texas, um, NAI Health Partners, and then we later merged with Transwestern. And um, through that time, just started um, on the ground floor and worked my way up um, and within the company of becoming a, a partner in the firm and uh, the youngest person nationally at Transwestern. Um, honored by that, just through a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. And um, so my primary background is on the industrial side of the business. And I chose to get into the industrial because that's what I was most comfortable and had already had experience just growing up. My father owned manufacturing businesses. So they built overhead bridge cranes and conveyor systems. So being a female, having that background already, um, it made a lot of sense. And I, I somewhat knew what I was talking about getting into business <laughs> at a young age. You know, you don't know everything. Make it um, till you make it, right? <laughs> yeah. I was a pro at that <laughs> door by door. I always tell people kind of my success is that I went through a bunch of hills. So just going through these industrial parks door to door and building my network and um, building my client base, literally going door to door. So I would wear out a bunch of heels. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about that a little bit. I don't want to skim over the fact that you got started at a young age and quickly rose to the top at Trans Western before you know going out and doing your own thing, right? I mean, like that you know that period of time. I you said what about ten years um, from the time you started to the time of founding Landcart Commercial? Is that what Correct. it was? Or, okay, mm -hmm. just under. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so you made it seem like it was like super easy. I just walked around, knocked on some doors and got a lot of business. And we all know that that's just not the case, right? It surely wasn't that easy. You put in lots of long hours. Um, you know, I'm assuming that you probably had some some great leadership or a great mentor or mentors there at Transwestern. And you know, obviously you you were a little bit born into the um, the real estate space, but not so much, right? I mean, like your father owned manufacturing, obviously a smart businessman. Uh, however, you know, what you were learning in the transactional side of the business uh, with industrial was probably very different than what his day-to-day -day looked like, right? And so I'd love to, you know, hear from your perspective of 
what those first couple like transitional years really look like for you when you stepped into the space? Um, and, uh, you know, how did you find your way? Cause you found it very quickly, but how did you go about doing that? Yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was definitely not easy, especially those first couple of years and everybody. So I got in, in 2009, um, and got my license in 2008. I mean, we're in the middle of a downturn and everyone's asking, you know, why the heck are you getting into real estate right now? And it was the best time that I could think of to actually get in, you know, looking back on it now is because people had time to spend with me and give more advice um, on, on what to do. And you start laying the groundwork and, you know, those first couple of years are tough and everybody guys says you're not going to make any money and they're, and they're correct. Cause <laughs> uh, it just takes time. And, Um, had a guy, his name was Jerry Alexander. Um, and he hired me into this business. He passed away about five years ago. Um, but I, um, owe him so much and for giving me a chance, you know, at first he wasn't going to hire me and I had told him basically, you know, you're making a mistake. I won't let you down. And he gave me a, gave me a chance. And then he, he advised me along the way, but it wasn't, without a lot of hard work that got me to where I am today. And, um, you know, my dad being in sales, he was there in the background encouraging me. And, um, basically I had a system where I'd print out 50 flyers a day for a property that Jerry had put me on a listing for, and I didn't know what else to do. So I just went door to door passing out flyers, um, (laughs) on properties and, and, you know, walking into the back of a warehouse and, um, these people are, what are you doing? I'm, well, I've got a building down the street for a lease and just putting in the hours. And no, I mean, I remember specifically like one day I pulled into a gas station after making calls. Actually, I think I probably just drove around the park and never made it into the front door of the calls. Um, and I'm like, what the heck am I doing? I've got two degrees. I'm getting the door slammed in my face. Um, you know, is this really worth it? But the more I just stuck with it, the more um, I built my network, the more mm-hmm. things just started to fall into place. And, and pe- I started to be build a reputation in this town of someone who's going to work and going to do what they said you're going to do. And, and just building my client base, literally, I say door to door. I mean, um, you know, and there, there's a lot more to it than that. But I mean, that's what really um, I think helped lay the groundwork for what I'm doing today. I'm going to sum it up real quick. You're basically <laughs> willing to do what others weren't willing to do. I mean, seriously, uh, you know, actually going door to door, literally handing out manually handing out flyers and guys, she's based in Texas. Texas gets hot, especially when you start talking about industrial uh, centers where probably most of them, like there are certain sections of that facility that does not have good air conditioning or ventilation. Right. So you're out there humping it around and, and probably just, you know, working in that Texas heat and uh, just, you know, trying to make it, which is awesome. So during that time, you, you, you had ebbs and flows with believing in yourself or maybe not believing in yourself, but believing in this, this career path. And, uh, and, and, and I'm sure you questioned it multiple different times, as, as you'd mentioned, as you're sitting there in the parking lot. What helped you keep the faith? What, what, what was that? Did you have a mental exercise you'd go through? Did you go listen to heavy metal and get all jacked up? I don't know. Like there, was, there had to be something that, that regrounded you back to the original belief that you had when you first started putting in the hours and putting in the effort. So what was that that, that would always bring you back to believing in, in what it was you were doing and that, you know, knowing that there was going to be a positive outcome at the end if you just stuck with it? Yeah, I mean, that's... I wish I could say there was one simple thing that kind of kept me motivated and going, but it was a multiple of different things um, from mentors, you know, throughout my career that I've, that I've found and built relationships with that have encouraged me through my father, through clients um, for every, you know, couple doors that are slammed in your face, that next deal is around the corner and then you get a yeah. lead and, um, you know, all of those little things just start adding up. And um, I would have a theme song. I still have theme songs that (laughs) that I'll listen to in the car. It changes every couple weeks that get me pumped up. And sometimes you just need that to get out of the car and go make a call or pick up the phone to someone that you think is not going to answer. I mean, some of the relationships that I've built with today are with 
people that I never in a million years thought they'd answer my call. They answered on the first time and then start texting me and we build, yeah. you know, I mean, it's just, um, I think you got to have the courage and when you start gaining experience and, and know what you're talking about, um, it's like, you know, it's like golf. I don't know if you golf or not. And I'm a horrible golfer. I literally probably play once a year and uh, it's, you go out and you shoot one good shot out of the, you know, the hundred and other, at least for me, it's like the hundred and other, like 15 shots that you take, which, which means I'm a horrible golfer that it takes me 115 <laughs> swings to make it through an 18 hole course. But you hit that one good shot and it literally makes you come back the next time, you know, and uh, it's just that one good shot, you know, get, it's a little break that you get there, just the, the little shining light that you see at the end of the tunnel. And it sounds like that's, you got a couple of those little shots along the way and they allowed you to, to kind of keep the course and know that, okay, this is just a momentum thing. I got to build more, more momentum here and just keep me to doing what I'm doing. And so that's awesome. And you know, guys, <clears throat> Sarah's really, she, she's being very humble here on this show. And I'm just going to take a moment to um, reflect on a few of the career highlights that you've had along the way. Um, and I'm sure there's probably more, don't know how updated or outdated this list might be, but you were named uh, top commercial broker in Fort Worth magazine. Um, DECEO listed you as a power broker in 2016, 2017. Fort Worth Business Press uh, lists you as top 20 in their 20s. Uh, Biz Now's 35 under 35. Uh, you're one of Dallas rising stars of commercial real estate. And then Dallas Business Journal uh, lists you as the heavy hitter uh, back in 2011. So that was like shortly after getting started. I mean, you're already being classified as a, as a heavy hitter as you were wearing out those heels going door to door, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so that was literally two years into your stint here. And um, in any event, I think that's absolutely fantastic. And again, you're just, you're, I know you're being somewhat humble, but you've had a great success along the way. And so what I'd love to, to hear from you, Sarah, is, you know, you, uh, you, you really found your footing uh, with Transwestern. And um, did you stay with Transwestern up until the point that you went out on your own? No. So I um, had been with Transwestern about eight years and then was okay. approached by a, um, a local group that wanted to start their commercial division. And they had been approaching me for two years um, mm -hmm. and wasn't necessarily – say not interested, but not interested in making a switch. Um, but they approached me with this scenario of, um, of something I couldn't refuse. And mm -hmm. we closed about um, a million and a half square feet in 14 months and went over there. It was a great learning experience for me. We still have great relationship and working together. But um, after that time, you know, after about a year, we decided it probably wasn't the best fit for either of us and, and decided, you know, I think the other, the owner of the company, we're, we're very similar in mindset and personality. And I knew um, that it was time for me to go out and start, start land cart. Um, and so it's been about about one year since we started Landcart. Okay, so you you had you had two decisions there really um, at that point in time during that that pivotal moment, and that was you knew that you you weren't going to stay with uh, with that current group. Um, you could have obviously you know went and stepped in to another uh, uh, brokerage house. However, you decided to go out on your own. Talk to me about that that mental process. Um, I mean. That truly is fear of the unknown. However, you know, you started the commercial division for this this other group. How they, they were established. I'm not sure what sure what that comp plan or what that attractive nature looked like of that deal, but it probably was a little bit more secure than you actually going out and doing your own thing. And so, uh, help me help me think through with you back in that time, or I guess you know, just a year ago, a little over a year ago, of, of truly transitioning to uh, the founding of your own company, and uh, what what that what was that like emotionally for you? Sure. So, um, I mean, all of it's been scary, but I've been a hundred percent commissioned since the day I've started. Um, and this, this was kind of the next step and, you know, you can go back. Um, I mean, there's a, we have a ton of great brokerage houses is our net, in our market, but mm -hmm. at the same point, um, I didn't want to go back to the same, same scenario I was in at, uh, Transwestern, although a great group of people, to me, you know, there's still a brokenness in our industry on the brokerage side of how you operate under a name, but everyone is still a very independent broker 
um, operating, you know, under an umbrella. And I wanted to create an environment of which we were really talking about deals with everybody in the office, you know, whether it's the industrial group or the office group or retail and really collaborating and, um, a mind share approach of, of we're all in it together. Um, and so that's what really prompted me instead of going back to another larger shop to, to really start, um, land cart and, and really create an atmosphere that you want to come to the office versus working remotely all the time and, and really collaborate on how we can all best help our clients and, and, and serve our market. Theoretically, that sounds wonderful, but how, how do you, how did you effectively roll that out and, and integrate in, you know, that into the fabric of your company? Yeah. So we're, we're meeting on a weekly basis basis um to talk about how we best grow the company and we're we're sharing we're keeping track of all the deals in our market everything we're working on everything other brokers are working on and we're sharing we're we're meeting on a regular basis to talk about everything and really setting up a, a structure of which um incentivizes everybody to share and and work together okay fantastic I'd love to get your feedback on, um, you know, even back 10 years ago when you were just first getting your start, um, I think his name was Jerry, your mentor. He wasn't even really willing to give you a shot right from the get-go and you kind of, for, it sounded like you forced his hand a little bit, which is <laughs> awesome. Um, no, but commercial real estate in my mind, maybe I'm wrong. I think it's slowly shifting, but it, it still is a very much a male dominated field. And I, I like to always joke around saying it's a male dominated field of old grumpy men. And I know that's changing over time. You and I are both here and we're not, we're not, I'm not an old man. I don't think I am. I guess my kids probably think I am, but uh, in any event, I think we're, you know, there's a lot of new blood coming into the industry, but at the end of the day, it's still very much is dominated by, by males. And so um, I'd love to get your perspective of, of kind of coming up in a male dominated industry and just, you know, uh, especially like in Texas. And when I think of Texas, I just think of, you know, it's a man state, you know, it's just, you know, just, I, I don't know. Maybe that's me. Maybe that's, maybe I got the wrong impression of a Texas. Everything's bigger there and it's just uh, a burly state, you know? And so how, how does Sarah, you know, uh, how does she make her way? I mean, how do you make your way and how do you push through all the noise and, um, and really set yourself apart and put yourself up to where people can see you when you've got all these other grumpy men trying to uh, uh, filter you out. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, so I'm still the only female industrial broker in my market. There's That's a awesome. Of Good for you. In Fort Worth. Thank you. Um, yeah. And, you know, most of the time I tell people in honesty, it played to my advantage. I mean, I was a different face um, coming into a warehouse when it's typically suits and, you know, a male driven on industry and, and you've got a, a woman walking into the warehouse, you know, I think in some ways, I think in general it played to my benefit, but in, in other ways uh -huh. it didn't, you know, I mean, I had to prove myself, I, I believe more so than a man walking in that I knew what I was talking about. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, they were like, well, who are you? And, and what do you really know about industrial? And then the more you prove yourself, um, you know, the more respect you, you gain and, and confidence from other people that, that you do know what you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, I still think there's, there's a long, we still have a long way to go and, and getting other women into this business. And, and, um, you know, I would say sometimes, you know, as females, we can be a little bit more emotional and, and take things, you know, more personal and this business is tough in the sense that there's a lot of rejection and you have to be able to take it. Um, yeah. but, but the more and more you can push through it, um, you know. Yeah, no, no, I agree with you. That, that's <laughs> That's great. Um, so I know that you spend most of your, your days on the transactional side in, in land cart commercial. Um, however, uh, you know, you made me aware that you also, you know, play in the, in the investment side of the business as well uh, with your own investments. And as I'd mentioned to you, uh, a good portion of this show uh, is where we, you know, we interview successful commercial real estate investors, you know, those that are actually uh, on the ownership side versus the, just the transactional side. And so, I'd love to get from your perspective. I know that you're focusing on, on industrial, uh, on the transactional side of your business. Is that also where you dabble on the investment side as well? Do you stay in the same niche? 
For the most part, yes. I mean, we, we want to invest in what we know in and understand, and, and that's where we can bring the most value um, to, to the assets. Okay. Where do you, where, where is the greatest opportunity in your eyes from an investment side? So you kind of, you wear two different hats, right? Um, where is the biggest opportunity in the, in the industrial sector um, in, in your market today from an investment perspective? I mean, just, I know this is just, this is just a personal opinion and that's what I'm seeking. Sure. So, you know, we all know we're at the top of a market cycle and, and the industrial um, asset class has been one of the, top asset classes that everyone's seeking currently, um, or a lot of groups are. Um, and, and, and prices are high, and you're seeing a lot of stuff that, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's still opportunities to be found, and I think you know we're, we're focused on kind of more that BC product type infill and, and finding you know off-market opportunities that um, – you know, your institutional groups are not chasing, but larger than your, you know, mom and pop that are just buying smaller deals. Mm-hmm. What, what is that typical market size? I mean, so like the middle market, I mean, give me like a, a general price range. And this, this is obviously specific to Dallas Fort Worth, but what does that range look like in industrial? Three to 10 million. Okay. Okay. Single tenant, multi tenant, a little bit of both. A little bit of both. Okay. Um, you know, right now is definitely not a buyer's market um, in in the Dallas Fort Worth, but I think there's also there's growth. So Fort Worth is is growing tremendously, um, and you know we offer the same logistical infrastructure as, as Dallas, so thirty five, thirty, twenty, um, and we have you know, people moving into the, to the Metroplex, um, I forget what the number is, you know, per day, but, um, it's significant. And so I see some of the outlying cities, you know, that aren't in necessarily the core part of Fort Worth, you know, those areas growing and, and, and there's going to be, you know, where house off households are going in, there's going to be demand for industrial space in those areas. Yeah. Now, I know that th- this is a slight shift of gears. I know that, you know, Texas as a whole was predominantly a conservative, conservative state. Uh, you've got, you've got pockets of, um, of blue here and there, but majority red. Um, I know that Governor Abbott just recently signed, I think it was bill, House Bill 3703, I believe, uh, which allowed an ex- expanded use of uh, medicinal marijuana. Um, I think there was something that just changed very recently in the last couple of days to where they've somewhat limited the number of applications because they were getting flooded with them. However, we know that in, in multiple other markets out there, you've got medicinal and they got recreational. I'm not sure how far away. Yeah, Texas is probably still years away from it being recreational, um, a, as a lot of the conservative states are. Uh, however, we do know that in these states where um, both medicinal and recreational um, have, have been uh, you know, allowed, Industrial, especially like the C class stuff, has seen a major boon in, in overall value and demand. What's your perspective of, of, of how the changes with, with marijuana and the acceptance of it uh, might affect your local real estate market there? So I don't think it's going to affect us as much as, you know, obviously Colorado, because I think mm-hmm. we're going to be one of the last states. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but of course, I mean, as more demand comes into the market for that sort of product, I mean, it's obviously going to impact it on a positive side of, you know, more demand. The problem, you know, is, is, you know, we need more supply in our market and you're seeing spec development still continue and, and that will open up, you know, more B and C product. Um, You know, if, if it were to happen today, we would have a real issue because we don't have enough supply and, and as additional demand comes in, I think, you know, it would drive up prices significantly. So depending on what side of the table you're on um, is whether it's a positive or a negative. Yeah, I guess so. What, what is the current vacancy uh, in, in, you know, just industrial in general in Dallas, Fort Worth? I mean, we're below 6%, you know, current vacancy. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. I don't know the exact off the top of my head. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. No, no worries. No worries. 
All right. I'd love to shift gears if we could, Sarah, and I'd like to enter, you know, what we call the lightning round. And this is where I'm going to ask you six very concise short questions. And, and we're seeking six very concise answers on the backside. And so uh, a couple of these do get a little personal, which we like to always put that, that personal touch onto the show. Um, the first question being your biggest fear. What is your biggest fear? I never want to lose anybody else's money. Um, so, so fear of failure. And I think that's what drives you. It's like what Warren Buffett said, um, never ever lose money. And so i you know, if I'm, uh, working with a client and they're investing in a property or, or we're investing in a property being conservative, but also the ability to take risks, but I don't want to do it at the sake of other people, you know? Yeah. I love it. I love it. How about your one biggest regret? Oh man. One biggest regret. Um, probably not investing with more people in 2010 and 2009 <laughs> in some property. <laughs> Hallelujah. I feel you. <laughs> How about most influential business book? Most influential. So there's a book, I cannot remember the author off the top of my head, but it's uh, The Art of Choice. And it's hmm. an interesting book that was written by a blind um, woman who basically had no, you would think of a person who has little choices to make in their life of how impactful, you know, being able to make a choice is and how to make a choice effectively and quickly. Um, because, you know, in t- today's world, there's so many options that are thrown at you and, and learning how to m- make decisions quickly and effectively, how important that is. Yeah. No, that's awesome. How about outside of the daily work ride? What do you do to decompress? I enjoy running. Um, so I typically go for a run each evening and then spending time with my husband at the ranch. All righty. Good deal. How about the one thing that you can't live without? The one thing I can't. Probably iced coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Everyone's got a vice, right? <laughs> <laughs> Last question is what would your plan be? ultimately be if uh, you decided that you didn't want to be in real estate any longer? Jeez, I haven't really ever thought about a plan B. Um, I love this business. Um, But I would say I enjoy, I'm not any good at it and would be terrible at it, but um, architecture and design. I I love that aspect of the business, but I'm not very good at it. (laughs) Plan B doesn't ever have to revolve around actually being successful or making money at something. You know, it's always like a, you know, what's the one thing that I feel is a, a hobby or of an interest that I probably haven't pursued because, you know, it's just, I'm not passionate in that way that I want to make money at it, but I really enjoy doing it. Right. Or I would, I think I would like enjoy doing it. So like for me, I'm a huge cyclist. You're a runner. I'm a big cyclist. I love cycling and I love doing like long distance, like multiple day trips. And uh, I'm pretty sure that I would just get on a bike if I, you know, if I literally didn't have to make money for a period of time and I didn't have a wife and I didn't have kids, right? So I got all these things. Uh, uh, I'd probably go spend some time on a bike and, and, and uh, just, I don't know what I would do. That'd be my plan. I'd turn it into a business somehow, maybe. But other than that, I think I'd just ride my bike. <laughs> no. Yeah, I could be a, tr- you know, travel the world. There yeah. you go. On a bike. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Sarah. Lots of great information shared today. Uh, lots of golden nuggets along the way. And however, I'd like to ask if you just had one final gold nugget of advice or wisdom that, that you could leave with our listeners today that may inspire and motivate them as they progress in their real estate career. What would that one last golden nugget be? I know you got one in your pocket still. There's one left. I'd say just don't be afraid, you know. Yeah everyone's approachable um, and, and just make the calls and, and, and don't be afraid. What has your experience, your personal experience been with that? I mean, I feel like the ones, you know, we typically build up these, these false expectations, especially when you're out there, you're calling on these property owners, you know, some you start doing your data, your research and seeing the data and they, you know, you got these very prominent real estate owners that own hundreds of millions of dollars worth of real estate and you start discouraging discouraging yourself and, and, and setting these false expectations of how bad the call is going to go or they're not going to want to talk to me. And have you found that it's typically the opposite, that the ones that end up being more approachable are the ones that are, um, you know, I guess deemed to be more successful based on their, their holdings versus uh, those that might be smaller investors? I mean, have you found that to be the case? 100%. Yeah. 100%. Me too. Um, yeah. 
They want to hear from you. And even on, even the companies too. I mean, at a young age, I was working on some really large tenant rep assignments that no one in no one would think that I got the business on my own, but it was just because I wasn't afraid to pick up the phone and, and call and ask for it. And, and you know, yes, you have to prove yourself and show your competency, but at the same point, if you never ask, you'll never know. Yeah. Uh, I love it. Absolutely fantastic. Well, uh, folks, if you have an interest in learning more about Sarah and her company, Landcart Commercial, you can visit her website. It's landcartcre.com and that's Landcart, L-A-N-C-A-R-T-E and then C-R-E. So landcartcre.com. Sarah, that's all we have for today. Is there anything else that you feel we might have missed that's of relevance that you'd like to uh, share with the listeners before we say goodbye? I think we covered it. All righty. <laughs> Well, fantastic. Well, thank you, Sarah, for coming on the show. And, and thank you to each and every one of you that, that tuned into this week's podcast. And until we meet again next week, this is your host, Kevin Bupp, wishing you huge success.